Prior to bearing the gold plates in the 5th century, Moroni warned first readers of the Book of Mormon to awake to a sense of your awful situation because of this secret combination, which shall be among you. For whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries. Commenting on this passage in 1831, Disciples of Christ founder Alexander Campbell observed, Moroni laments the prevalency of Freemasonry in the times when his books should be dug up out of the earth. Campbell wasn't alone in identifying the Book of Mormon's discussion of secret combinations with Freemasonry. In 1838, Methodist minister and abolitionist Leroy Sunderland also remarked, The reader will find frequent allusions in the Book of Mormon to Freemasonry under the names of secret societies, dreadful oaths, and secret combinations. Hi, I'm Dan Vogel. Many researchers and historians have long regarded as obvious the Book of Mormon's reflection of the cultural milieu of early 19th century America, particularly the anti-Masonic controversy that pervaded Western New York during the late 1820s. As discussed in my previous video, the Book of Mormon's frequent discussion of secret combinations, both ancient and modern, was understood by many of its first readers as a reference to Freemasonry. To them, the Book of Mormon's warning seemed either prophetically timely or proof of Joseph Smith's authorship. Disagreeing with Book of Mormon witness Martin Harris, who held that the Gold Bible was also the anti-Masonic Bible, current Mormon apologists argue that the Book of Mormon's warning of a Latter-day Secret combination which utilizes secret words and secret signs and attempts to overthrow the freedom of all lands referred to no specific group, although it obviously reflected anti-Masonic rhetoric at the time and place of the Book of Mormon's appearance. In this video, I will examine 15 of the major arguments that the apologists have put forward in an attempt to overturn the anti-Masonic thesis. Along the way, I hope that my viewers will gain a deeper understanding of the Book of Mormon in its 19th century setting. In his 1984 book, Joseph Smith and the Beginnings of Mormonism, Mormon historian Richard L. Bushman acknowledged a few obvious similarities between the Book of Mormon and anti-Masonic rhetoric, but contended that such parallels are superficial. Mormon scholar Blake T. Osler tried to account for the similarities between the Book of Mormon and its 19th century environment in his 1987 article, The Book of Mormon as a Modern Expansion of an Ancient Source, suggesting that what occurs in the book is Joseph Smith's independent commentary on masonry, sparked by his reflection on Nephite secret combinations. Disregarding the many early accounts that describe Smith's translation method as a mechanical process of reading the English text as it appeared in the stone, Osler embraced a flexible view of translation, in which Smith played an active role as inspired commentator and expander of the ancient text. This enabled him to account for the presence of anti-Masonic rhetoric, while at the same time defending the book's ancient origin. The late D. Michael Quinn not only dismissed the Book of Mormon's anti-Masonic parallels as superficial in his 1987 book, Early Mormonism and the Magic World View, and again in the 1998 revision of his book, but argued that secret combinations actually refers to witchcraft and occult murders, an interpretation that remains unique to him. While rejecting Quinn's novel interpretation, Mormon apologist Daniel C. Peterson was only too happy to repeat some of his criticisms against the anti-Masonic interpretation. In his 1990 Notes on Gedeonton Masonry, which was intended as a response to my 1989 essay, Mormonism's Anti-Masonic Bible, Peterson concluded that there is no reason to insist upon a simple one-to-one -one equation between the Gadianton robbers 
in any single modern organization. I will now examine each of the apologetic arguments against the anti-Masonic thesis as presented by Bushman, Osler, Quinn, and Peterson. According to Bushman, critics in Joseph Smith's own day made so little of anti-Masonry in the Book of Mormon. Not only is this the first of a series of specious arguments from silence, but it is incorrect as well. As we have seen, many in Smith's day, including Alexander Campbell in 1831, Eber D. Howe and Jason Whitman separately in 1834, Edward Strutt Abdi in 1835, and Leroy Sunderland in 1838 and 1842, among others, identified the Book of Mormon's discussion of ancient secret societies and 19th century secret combinations with Freemasonry. From this, we can see that Bushman is also wrong when he asserts that critics after Campbell neglected the point entirely, since they credited Solomon Spaulding with authorship. Mormon convert Oliver B. Huntington's experience in New York in 1843 demonstrates that this interpretation was far from dead. Huntington recorded that a Mr. Millard said he knew all about Mormonism and what it sprang from. It sprang from Masonry, or the death of William Morgan, that Mormon was derived from the word Morgan. He said he would prophesy in the name of the Lord Jehovah that Mormonism did spring from the death of Morgan. Bushman's assertion that the Spalding theory overshadowed other explanations is simply untrue. In his 1834 book, for instance, Howe presented both the Spalding theory and the anti-Masonic interpretation. They were not mutually exclusive, since those who advocated the Spalding theory usually believed that the manuscript had been reworked by Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, or both. Thus, Bushman overstates his case when he says, Campbell himself in time subscribed to the Spalding theory and dropped the point about masonry. Campbell's adoption of the Spalding theory does not necessarily mean he dropped the point about masonry. Speaking of first-generation Mormons, Bushman argues that the people who knew anti-Masonry and the Book of Mormon in the 1830s made less of the connection than critics today. Another argument from silence, but given the fact that two major anti-Mormon works, Campbell's 1831 critique and Howe's 1834 book, criticized the presence of anti-Masonry in the Book of Mormon, the lack of a Mormon response is not a good thing. Nevertheless, as early as 1831, no less than Book of Mormon witness Martin Harris declared that the Book of Mormon was the anti-Masonic Bible. In yet another argument from silence, Bushman also asserts that converts paid no attention to anti-Masonry. He does not explain how he knows this, but one should not make too much of such an argument since it could also be said that early converts paid no attention to teachings on the Godhead, baptism, spiritual gifts, or church government. In fact, the earliest Mormons lived in a culture of biblical supremacy and rarely referenced the Book of Mormon on any subject. As Grant Underwood's 1984 study, Book of Mormon usage in early LDS theology demonstrated. Bushman argues Lucy Smith Joseph Smith's mother, said nothing about Masonry, William Morgan, or anti-Masonry in her autobiography. Joseph was equally neglectful. This is hardly significant since Lucy and Joseph are also silent about a host of other important subjects. Not surprisingly, the Smith histories are silent about Joseph's use of a seer stone to hunt buried treasure in Manchester. His 1826 trial for glass looking in South Bainbridge, New York, his participation in Palmyra's debating club, and his involvement with the Methodists as an exhorter, the differing religious views of his parents, and Joseph Sr.'s drinking problem. Considering these lapses, the failure to mention the Morgan excitement of the mid 1820s is hardly significant. Yet we know that the Morgan affair was important and had a negative effect on attendance at Palmyra's Mount Moriah Lodge, which counted Joseph's older brother Hiram 
as one of its members. By the time Joseph and Lucy wrote their histories in 1838 and 1845, the subject of masonry and secret combinations had largely disappeared from local and national discourse, as well as from Mormon rhetoric, and anti-masonry was no longer as important as it once seemed. Bushman complains that the Book of Mormon groups known as Gadianton were not one continuing society, like the Masons, but five distinct combinations that sprang up among the Nephites and Jaredites. The Book of Mormon actually describes the ebb and flow of the Gadianton bands, depending on the wickedness or righteousness of the Nephite nation, and implies their continuity. Bushman sees the term Gadianton robbers as simply a convenient label for distinct groups. But after Mormon describes the founding of the Gadianton band, he observes that in the end of this book, ye shall see that this Gadianton did prove the overthrow, yea, almost the entire destruction of the Nephite people. Apparently, transmission between the first and second bands was accomplished through records hidden in the earth. Succeeding robber bands claimed Gadianton as their founder and held the belief that their oaths were of ancient date and handed down. The secret societies that appeared among the Nephites after the visit of Jesus and eventually led to their destruction were not independent. For Mormon states that the wicked part of the people began again to build up the secret oaths and combinations of Gadianton. Thus, the Book of Mormon's treatment of ancient secret societies is not as fragmentary as Bushman states. On the other hand, international Freemasonry was not as unitary as Bushman claims, since it was generally recognized to be divided among distinctive orders and rites, with two competing grand lodges in New York alone. The disunity of Masonry was noted by anti-Masonic minister Henry Dana Ward, who wrote in 1829, that the present convulsed state of Mexico is principally owing to the secret operations of two Masonic parties, the York Masons and the Scottish Masons. Ultimately, Bushman's complaint is irrelevant, since it was not imperative that Smith follow either a unitary or diversified history of Masonry. He was free to adapt such cultural borrowings to the requirements of his own work. The historical and literary critic seeks evidence of environmental influence, not exact replication. An author uses his life experiences to create something both familiar and unique, and some differences, especially of traits not considered particularly distinctive, should be expected. Bushman expresses surprise that the murder of the Masonic traitor William Morgan in 1826 had no equivalent in the Book of Mormon. Again, one should not expect an exact duplicate plotline in the Book of Mormon, but Morgan would be portrayed as a hero, not as a traitor. The Reverend David Pease's 1830 sermon provides a good example of how anti-Masons regarded Morgan. More than 100 ministers of the gospel have renounced and denounced Freemasonry, but it was reserved by the providence of God for Captain William Morgan to openly commence the attack upon this potent foe, which had secretly interwoven itself with all our civil, religious, and even domestic concerns. He bravely opened the war against that power, and though he fell as a martyr in the cause, he tore away the strongest pillars. The spell with many was now broken. A ray of light found its way into the chamber of darkness. The Book of Mormon's rhetoric about prophets being martyred at the hands of secret combinations could have been loosely inspired by Morgan's murder. Speaking of the latter-day secret combinations, Moroni warns, The Lord will not suffer that the blood of the saints, which shall be shed by them, shall always cry unto him from the ground for vengeance. By 1830, anti-Masons were expanding their rhetoric to include accusations of other Masonic murderers besides Morgan's. That year, social reformer Lebius Armstrong declared that many of the numerous murders which have polluted this and other lands with blood, which horrid deeds have been palmed on some innocent or unknown persons, 
have been really the bloody fruits of Masonic executions. It is awfully feared that when the light of eternity shall shine on the deeds of darkness, and every secret thing shall be brought into judgment, it will then be found that many of the sudden deaths in the world have been the result of Masonic vengeance in the execution of penalty in the lodge room, or personal dispatch by poison or assassination, as the ghosts of the murdered Artemis Kennedy near Boston, the poisoned Simmons of Albany, and a host of others, would doubtless testify now were they permitted to speak. The Book of Mormon also expresses the principle upon which anti-Masons believed Morgan's murder had been carried out, and whosoever of those who belong to their band should reveal unto the world of their wickedness and their abominations, should be tried, not according to the laws of their country, but according to the laws of their wickedness, which had been given them by Gadianton and Kishkumen. Later, as he worked on his inspired revision of the Bible in October 1830, Smith added passages in Genesis which had a more direct comparison to the Morgan affair disclosing that Lamech murdered Irad, the son of Enoch, for the oath's sake, because Irad, having known their secret, began to reveal it unto the sons of Adam. So Bushman's argument from silence is incorrect, since the Book of Mormon and other early revelations of Joseph Smith do reflect Morgan's story. Bushman insists that in the supposed anti-Masonic passages in the Book of Mormon, Nothing was said about Masonic degrees or elaborate initiation rituals. This argument from silence carries little weight, because the Book of Mormon itself repeatedly explains the omission. Moroni, for instance, states that he does not describe the oaths and combinations of the Jaredites, for it hath been made known unto me that they are had among all people, and they are had among the Lamanites. He then directly associates the Gadianton oaths with those practiced by latter-day secret combinations. It was unnecessary to repeat these secret oaths because readers were already familiar with them. Besides, a book purporting to be a history of Jewish immigrants with scant details of their elaborate rituals and customs can hardly be expected to record rituals that were considered satanic. The Book of Mormon does not give the details of the secret oaths, but it does provide general information that the first readers would have easily associated with Freemasonry. Mormon mentions the Gadianton bands, like Masons, had their signs, yea, their secret signs, and their secret words, and explains the purpose of such devices in language reminiscent of the anti-Masonic rhetoric. The Gadianton bands, he explains, adopted their secret signs and words that they might distinguish a brother who had entered into the covenant, that whatsoever wickedness his brother should do, he should not be injured by his brother, and explains that initiates promise that they would protect and preserve one another in whatsoever difficult circumstances they should be placed and they should not suffer for their murders and their plunderings and their stealings. By the time the Book of Mormon appeared, anti-Masons had widely published the secret Masonic oaths and rituals, including its signs and passes, or hand grips, and accompanying secret words, or names. Masons who received the secret word for the second degree were told that it was used by our ancient brethren to distinguish a friend from foe. Anti-Masons charged that the oaths were designed to protect their guilty brethren from the lash of the civil laws, whether guilty or not guilty, treason and murder not accepted, and although they may be obliged to swear falsely to clear the guilty brother, they must do it, or incur the penalty of secret death. While the Book of Mormon is reticent about detailing the secret oaths, signs, and words, it nevertheless gives hints. Akish's Jaredite secret combination included a death oath requiring initiates to swear unto him by the God of heaven, and also by the heavens, and also by the earth, and by their heads, that whosoever should vary from the assistance which Akish desired should lose his head. And whoso should divulge whatsoever thing Akish made known unto them, 
the same should lose his life. In his own book, Mormon reports that many of the Nephites enter into Masonic-like oaths, swearing before the heavens and by the throne of God to avenge the blood of their fathers. Mormon states that they had sworn by all that had been forbidden them by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This alludes to Jesus' teachings both in Palestine and America. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 33-37 quotes Jesus as saying, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, Yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. It was well known in Smith's day that Masonic degrees included penal signs and blood oaths, which described various ways life might be taken. The penalty for the first degree's entered apprentice, for instance, mentions having one's throat cut. Not until the higher degree of Knights Templar, as reported in the Wayne Sentinel on 14th of March, 1828, do we find mention of having one's head struck off. Not surprisingly, anti-Masons quoted Jesus' words against oath-taking. In a speech delivered before the Brethren of St. John's Lodge in Middletown, Connecticut, on August 12, 1830, General Chauncey Whittlesey renounced his Masonic affiliation, declaring, among other things, that Masonry is an anti-Christian institution, because Christ has said, Swear not at all, but in the Lodge, oath after oath of the most awful character is unnecessarily administered. One speaker at an anti-Masonic convention held in Philadelphia in 1830 said, The first oath they take when they enter the lodge, they violate both the laws of religion and morality. Christ says, Swear not at all. Every oath taken is in fact profane swearing, because it is unauthorized. So, Bushman's complaint that the Book of Mormon lacks details in its description of ancient and modern secret combinations, is weak and somewhat untrue. Osler states, A frequent charge against Masonry, also absent from the Book of Mormon, was that it displaced Christianity by being a religion itself. Book of Mormon bands of robbers were not a quasi-religious fraternity. Osler's depiction of both anti-Masonic rhetoric and the Book of Mormon's Gadianton bans is both incomplete and misleading. It is true that anti-Masonic rhetoric initially focused on the fraternity's assumed threat to Christianity, but following the apparent murder of William Morgan in 1826, the concern shifted to the implied erosion of civil liberties and free government. By 1828, this had become a highly politicized topic as anti-Masons organized to prevent the election of Andrew Jackson to the presidency. Religious concerns were not entirely displaced, but political and legal arguments dominated. One therefore should not expect to find the Gadianton robbers described as a religious organization. Instead, as expected, they are introduced during a hotly contested election, where they are involved in assassination plots until they are forced to flee into the wilderness, where they devolve into marauding robber bands. Contrary to Osler's portrayal, anti-Masons feared that Freemasonry could destroy rather than replace Christianity. In the introduction to Morgan's 1827 illustrations of Masonry, publisher David C. Miller declared, Masonry is to the modern world what the whore Babylon was to the ancient and is the beast with seven heads and ten horns, ready to tear out our bowels, and scatter them to the four winds of heaven. 
The Palmyra Freeman for 17th of November 1829 alleged that masonry was a secret combination to destroy liberty and religion. On the 23rd of November 1828, the Republican Monitor of Casanova, New York, declared that masonry was a dark, iniquitous, and corrupt combination against truth, equity, and the Church of Christ and a deep and broad conspiracy against republicanism and Christianity. Within months following the Book of Mormon's publication, the Reverend Lebius Armstrong called masonry a work of darkness, inspired by Satan to oppose, root out, destroy, and if possible, exterminate true religion from the world. Consistent with this view, the Book of Mormon portrays the Gadiantans as a threat to the true church. Mormon describes the purpose of the secret society, formed about 29 CE, to be that of protecting corrupt judges who were secretly executing the prophets. Alma concurs that secret combinations were responsible for murdering the prophets. Concerning the last days in particular, Nephi and Moroni warn of the corrupting effects of secret combinations on the church. Moroni speaks of the blood of God's saints which shall be shed by them. Osler's description of the Gadiantans as a secular robber band is deficient since there are also hints that their oaths included religious elements. Initiates entered into a covenant by swearing by their everlasting maker. Mormon mentions that Gadianton did not obtain his secret oaths and covenants from the Jaredite records, but rather by revelation from Satan. One of the Gadianton leaders declares that their works are good and of ancient date, arguing that they seek only to recover their rights and government. Fellow apologist Daniel C. Peterson recognized that Osler's statement needed modification. The fact that the Book of Mormon authors elected to treat Gadiantonism as a secular robber gang does not necessarily make them such. A close reading of the text, even in its present tendentious state, demonstrates that Gadiantonism was an ideological movement and an alternative religious vision of considerable seductive power. In light of the shifting emphasis after the Morgan affair, one finds the Gadiantons described in the Book of Mormon as might be expected, that is, with prophets controverting Gadianton claims of religious, just, and good ideals, with a portrayal of them as a Satan-inspired cult designed to destroy true religion and subvert free government. Osler argues, nowhere in anti-Masonic rhetoric were Masons referred to as a distinct band of robbers. The Masons were never identified as a group which held out in the mountains and attacked as marauding robbers. The Nephites tried the robbers under martial law and assigned responsibility for dealing with them to the military. Americans looked to their civil sheriffs, and Masons stood trial in the usual criminal courts. Osler even asserts the Book of Mormon secret societies differ from Masons in the precise ways they are similar to ancient Near Eastern bands of robbers. Osler could have just as easily said, the Book of Mormon secret societies differ from ancient Near Eastern bands of robbers in the precise ways they are similar to Masons. True, Masonry in 1829 was not considered a marauding robber band, but both anti-Masons and the Book of Mormon were warning Jacksonian America about potential dangers and future events. The Gadianton bands did not originate in the outback but emerged about 52 BCE among the Nephites during a hotly contested election as a secret society intent on infiltrating Nephite government by assassination, and only later were they driven into the wilderness and took on the characteristics that Osler emphasizes. Nothing prohibited Joseph Smith from blending elements from various places as he imagined the decline and fall of the Nephite nation. For example, he may have been aware of the Sakari, a band of robbers who operated in Palestine before the Roman destruction of Jerusalem about 70 CE, mentioned by Josephus, the first century Jewish historian. In his Antiquities of the Jews, 
Josephus writes that the country was again filled with robbers and impostors who deluded the multitude. These robbers, like the Gadiantans, lived in the caves and mountains near the city. Josephus reports that the robbers stirred up the people to make war with the Romans and said they ought not to obey them at all. And when any persons would not comply with them, they set fire to their villages and plundered them. And then it was that the Sicarii, as they were called, who were robbers, grew numerous. The Latin designation Sicarii refers to the daggers they concealed under their garments, which they used to assassinate Jewish merchants and officials who collaborated with the Romans. With these daggers, Josephus informs, they slew a great many, for they mingled themselves among the multitude at their festivals and easily slew those they had a mind to slay. Ironically, the Sicarii were hired by Felix, the Roman official in charge of Judea, to assassinate Jonathan the high priest, which they carried out by mingling with the crowd in the temple and then striking suddenly. Similar to Moroni, Josephus believed these secret murderers and robbers were responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem. It seems to me, he wrote, to have been the reason why God, out of his hatred of these men's wickedness, rejected our city. And as for the temple, he no longer esteemed it sufficiently pure for him to inhabit therein, but brought the Romans upon us, and threw a fire upon the city to purge it. Brigham Young University Assistant Professor of Ancient Scripture Lincoln H. Blumel doesn't deny that the respective purposes of the robbers in Josephus and the Book of Mormon are quite similar and their modus operandi share a number of parallels, but insists that this does not automatically suggest Joseph Smith's direct reliance on Josephus. Still, the similarity is striking, and nothing prevented Smith from blending it with anti-Masonic rhetoric about the Jacksonians. However, despite Osler's assertion about Masonry, the wilderness condition of masonry was not a foreign idea. According to Masonic lore, before lodges were erected, ancient masons met on the highest hills and the lowest vales because it was better to guard against cowans, or intruders, and enemies, either ascending or descending, that the brethren might have timely notice of their approach to prevent being surprised. Some lodges were themselves referred to as encampments. Thus, the Reverend Peter Sanborn worried in 1829 that masonry was an encampment entrenched on a high and inaccessible mountain, ready to rush down upon our country like an irresistible tornado. Whether in legend or metaphor, the wilderness imagery was there to expand upon. In view of the 1828 rhetoric, about Andrew Jackson's early involvement with the Aaron Burr conspiracy in the Western Territories in 1805 and 1806, which anti-Masons believed included a Masonic cover-up. The idea that plots to overthrow the government would come from the wilderness was not unrealistic. It remains unclear what Burr's full intentions were as he plotted his Western coup, but he gained lasting notoriety as a traitor and Jackson's involvement, though perhaps innocent, hurt him in the 1828 campaign. Concerning the Burr conspiracy, anti-Masonic writer Henry Dana Ward declared, The injury done to our national character by Burr's conspiracy was of the highest magnitude. The private correspondence of that conspiracy was carried on in the Royal Arch Cipher, which is a proof that the agents were exalted Freemasons. This accounts also for their escaping the vengeance of the law. The evidence of their guilt was chiefly in the mystic characters of Freemasonry and the royal arch breasts, and thus closed against the search of human tribunals by the profane oath and impious penalty of a royal arch mason's obligations. Osler is also incorrect about masons not being classed with robbers. The Wayne Sentinel for the 26th of September, 1828, reprinted an article alleging that masonry's real object is anarchy and plunder. Anti-Masons criticized the fraternity's attempt to gain unfair economic advantage 
over the uninitiated, and frequently quoted Volney's statement that every association which has mystery for its basis or an oath of secrecy is a league of robbers against society. Joseph Smith may have transformed Volney's metaphor into a dramatic portrayal, or simply assumed that Masons forced into encampments would degenerate into robber bands for survival. Osler added very little to Bushman's arguments. Later, the same year, Mormon historian D. Michael Quinn published his book, Mormonism and the Magic World View, that detailed Joseph Smith's involvement in treasure seeking and the occult. Pushing his thesis a bit too far, Quinn argued that the Book of Mormon's prediction of latter day secret combinations and secret murders really refers to witchcraft and occult murders, but offered little evidence in support of his occult thesis. Nevertheless, he attempted to overturn the anti-Masonic interpretation of the Book of Mormon's first readers, building on Bushman's previous arguments from silence and making irrelevant distinctions. Quinn argues that the vast majority of anti-Masons had always seen Freemasonry as a strictly modern development whereas the Book of Mormon claims that the secret combinations originated with Satan and Cain. Masons traced their origin to Solomon's temple, and some believe the principles of Freemasonry went back to Noah and even the Garden of Eden. In 1823, English cleric and prolific Masonic author George Oliver, for instance, described Adam and other patriarchs as grand masters and Eve as the mother of all Masons. Contrary to Quinn's assertion, anti-Masons tended to favor one of two rhetorical responses to this claim. The majority certainly argued that Masonry had a strictly modern origin, as Quinn observed. Others, however, argued that the secret society originated with Cain, the first murderer. Thus, Peter Sanborn, explaining Masonry's real origin, argued that the truth may be that the first Grand Arch Mason was Satan, the first secret lodge in Eden, between him and Eve. Cain, like Nimrod, rebelled against the priesthood and government of Adam. He, with Tubal Cain, no doubt, were Masons. Quinn is right that the second path stemmed more from necessity than from sincere belief in the antiquity of Masonry, but in making this observation, he is perhaps too dismissive for such subtlety may have escaped Joseph Smith. If anti-Masonic writers separated fact from rhetoric, it does not necessarily follow that their audiences did. Regardless, the possibility that Smith adopted an anachronistic approach with regard to Masonry should not come as a surprise, since his treatment of Christianity in the Book of Mormon is also anachronistic. Smith's association of Masonry with Cain was made even clearer in his inspired revision of Genesis. Sometime between June and October 1830, only months after the Book of Mormon came off the press, Smith dictated an anti-Masonic interpretation of Cain's murder of Abel, revealing that Cain had secretly covenanted with Satan to murder Abel for gain. He then added an unmistakably anti-Masonic passage to Genesis. And Cain said, Truly, I am Mahan, the master of this great secret, that I may murder and get gain. Wherefore, Cain was called Master Mahan, and he gloried in his wickedness. There can be little doubt that Smith intended Master Mahan as a play on Master Mason, the name given to third-degree Masons. For these reasons, Quinn's objection that the Book of Mormon isn't anti-Masonic because it assigns an ancient origin for secret combinations, can therefore be dismissed. Quinn asserts, Whereas anti-Masons typically claimed that Masonry was a fraternal organization dedicated to overthrowing Christianity and monarchy, the Book of Mormon repeatedly claimed that the main purpose was to murder and plunder, and that the subversion of governments was necessary only for gaining the power to protect these murders and plunders. Ultimately, this distinction amounts to nothing, even if true. Quinn wants to diminish the political context of secret combinations because it doesn't fit his attempt to interpret them as witch covens and occult murders. Nevertheless, 
Quinn was wrong. According to the Book of Mormon, the goals of the secret combinations were to get power and gain, that is, political power and economic gain, and resort to murder and robbery as the quickest means of obtaining them. Political power certainly had the added benefit of protecting the perpetrators of murder and robbery, but the first murders were political assassinations. The first secret society among the Nephites was formed about 52 BCE to protect Kishkumen, who had assassinated Peheren, the chief judge. Later, Gadianton became the leader of Kishkumen's band and sought to become chief judge himself. He promised his co-conspirators that if they would place him in the judgment seat, he would grant that they should be placed in power and authority among the people. To place Gadianton in power, Kishkumen tried to assassinate Helaman, who had replaced Peheran as chief judge. However, Kishkumen's plot was discovered by one of Nephi's servants and killed. Prior to his death, Kishkumen revealed to one of Helaman's servants that it was the object of all those who belonged to his band to murder and to rob and to gain power. Thus, Gadianton's band was formed to advance political intrigue. This is the opposite of what Quinn asserts, for rather than seeking civil office for protection, Gadianton and his band derived protection from the oaths obligating them to secrecy while they plotted to get political power. Political objectives were therefore integral, not peripheral, to Gadiantonism. A subsequent Gadianton group, organized about 16 CE, proclaimed its intention to overthrow the Nephite government by force if necessary. Gadianhi, the governor of the Gadiantons, writes in an epistle to Laconius, leader of the Nephites, asking him to surrender the reins of government or be destroyed. In his letter, Gadianhi imparts some Gadiantan political philosophy. I hope that ye will deliver up your lands and your possessions without the shedding of blood, that this people may recover their rights and government. This hardly sounds as though Gadiantan political objectives were of incidental interest. The secret society organized about 29 CE to protect corrupt judges similarly challenges Quinn's assertion that Gadiantans infiltrated government for protection. In this instance, the secret society protected public officials, not the reverse. This same society conspired to establish one of its members, Jacob, as king, demonstrating again that political power was a major objective. The secret society among the Jaredites also had a similar political origin. In this case, Jared and Akish conspired to assassinate King Omer. Moroni describes the oaths administered by Akish, which had existed since the days of Cain, and were designed to help such as sought power to gain power, and to murder and to plunder and to lie, and to commit all manner of wickedness and whoredoms. Thus, Jared's conspiracy, like that of Gadianton's, sought political rule as a major objective. This brief overview shows the Book of Mormon to be in line with what Quinn acknowledged for anti-Masonic rhetoric. That is, that Masonry was dedicated to the overthrow of Christianity and monarchy, or more accurately in America, the overthrow of the Republican government. As one anti-Mason declared in 1829, Masonry is directly calculated to overturn every religion and every civil government on earth. According to Masons, New York Governor DeWitt Clinton had admitted as early as 1825 that Masonry was dangerous because it has conspired against all governments. The Wayne Sentinel for 18th of July 1828 reported that anti-Masons objected to the institution because it affords opportunities for the corrupt and designing to form plans against the government. And the New England Anti-Masonic Almanac for 1831 recognized that Masonry is peculiarly adapted to political intrigue. One should not push too hard for exact parallels, as I have previously argued, since the Gadiantans are only intended to be analogous to Jacksonian America as a warning of political dangers. So, one should not expect to find Masons accused of assassinating public officials or forming military coups in the wilderness. Instead, one should view such elements as a reflection of Joseph Smith's imagination, his attempt to create for his readers frightening images of what Masonry could become.
Bushman disagrees with Quinn and suggests that the Gedianton bands could, with equal ease, be perceived as modern terrorist guerrillas, dissenters at war with the old order, penetrating villages on the margins of official control, undermining from within and attacking openly when they had strength. Viewed in context, the Masonic-like oaths and covenants were secondary to direct attacks on government through assassinations and military raids. Despite Bushman's apologetic, it's not a matter of which element is primary or secondary, which is irrelevant and meaningless. But, of course, Bushman wants to minimize the secret oaths so that the Book of Mormon can better fit his generic description. To first readers, the secret signs, words, and oaths were integral to the Book of Mormon's description. Indeed, the oaths and covenants were central to the Gadianton plan of infiltration, as well as to their cohesion and identity. Alma considered the oaths and covenants crucial enough to command his son to retain them from the people, lest peradventure they should fall into darkness and also be destroyed, and the oaths were the means of bringing down the people unto destruction. Thus, one cannot with equal ease apply the Book of Mormon's description of the Gadianton bands to modern terrorist guerrillas. In the context of the 1828 election, Jackson and his followers were the dissenters at war with the old order. It was a period of extreme tension and represented a major shift in the balance of power in the United States. Not surprisingly, many predicted doom upon the young nation and feared that the situation would degenerate into civil war. Given Masonry's own militaristic imagery, its reference to encampments and knights, together with its apparent union with the liberal Democrats headed by the famous General Jackson, whose brutality was a feature of the opposition's campaign rhetoric, Joseph Smith would not have to stretch his imagination too far to come up with the militant Gadianton bands. Peterson finds that one of the major difficulties with the anti-Masonic interpretation is that one must see Joseph Smith as a vocal and committed anti-Mason in 1830, who then, only 12 years later, enthusiastically joined the Masons and, as some would have it, borrowed the most sacred rituals of his religion from them. Where, then, is the evidence of his alleged conversion from anti-Masonry in the late 1820s, during the translation of the Book of Mormon, to pro-Masonry in the 1840s, when he was revealing the ordinances of the temple. The situation in America had dramatically changed by the time Joseph Smith became a Freemason on the 15th of March, 1842. But his so-called conversion to Masonry was not complete, for soon after joining, he devalued the system by claiming it was a corrupt version of his temple endowment. On the 17th of June, 1842, Heber C. Kimball wrote fellow apostle Parley P. Pratt in England. There is a similarity of priesthood in Masonry. Brother Joseph Smith says Masonry was taken from priesthood. Later, Benjamin F. Johnson reported that Joseph Smith told me Freemasonry, as at present, was the apostate endowments, as sectarian religion was the apostate religion. Thus, Peterson's use of conversion with regard to Masonry is misleading. Regardless, Smith's embrace of Masonry, even if it were complete, cannot be used to argue that he wasn't anti-Masonic more than a decade earlier. Historians recognize this as a species of the idealist fallacy, which is the assumption that humans always act consistently and rationally. As historian David Hackett Fisher observes, a presumption of logical consistency is as unjustified as a presumption of the opposite. If Smith reversed himself on masonry, it was not the only instance. Smith subsequently changed his mind on the nature of the Godhead and the duration of hell and punishment, for example, which were Book of Mormon doctrines. No matter what interpretation one holds of the Book of Mormon and masonry, one must acknowledge that Joseph Smith opposed Masonry in principle, if not in fact, before he joined the order. In 1839, Smith spoke against the impropriety of bands or companies 
being organized by covenant or oaths, by penalties or secrecies. Pure friendship always becomes weakened the very moment you undertake to make it stronger by penal oaths and secrecy. Smith's later change of attitude did not go unnoticed. Decades later, Ebenezer Robinson, who was the editor of the Times and Seasons and a member of the Nauvoo Masonic Lodge, said, Hitherto,fore the church had strenuously opposed secret societies such as Freemasons and Knights of Pythias, not considering the order of Enoch and Danites of that class. But after Dr. John C. Bennett came into the church, a great change of sentiment seemed to take place. James C. Brewster, who became the leader of a dissident Mormon group, saw the endowment as a contradiction of earlier teachings. In 1849, Brewster declared that the church had fallen by imperceptible degrees until 1842, when the final step was taken by the introduction of a secret order in direct violation of almost every command in the gospel of Christ. The priesthood does not consist in high-sounding titles, in secret combinations, in key words and mysteries, he wrote. All interpreters, not just those proposing an anti-Masonic interpretation of the Book of Mormon, must deal with Joseph Smith's inconsistency. Peterson argues that secret combinations is a generic term for any secret society, and disputes my 1989 contention that at the time of the Book of Mormon's publication, the term secret combinations was used almost exclusively to refer to Freemasonry. Consequently, Peterson and his fellow apologists think that it's a simple matter of searching for exceptions, no matter how far removed from the time and place of the Book of Mormon's publication. My 1989 statement was based on extensive reading in the primary documents, but with the advent of Google, about two dozen non-Masonic uses of the phrase secret combinations have been located. However, my intention was to show that, in the context of the 1828 U.S. presidential campaign, in which Andrew Jackson's opponents exploited his Masonic affiliation, the phrase had become politically charged, not that anti-Masons had invented the phrase. In such an environment, the term had become laden with anti-Masonic connotation, and hence it informed first readers in their unanimous interpretation of the Book of Mormon as anti-Masonic. The term secret combinations had special significance to anti-Masons, especially in western New York, where William Morgan had been abducted and presumably murdered by the Masons in 1826. To many people, it seemed that the perpetrators were being protected by fellow Masons who had infiltrated the government. Only six weeks after Morgan's disappearance, the citizens of Leroy resolved to withhold votes from any candidate for public office who has in any way aided, assisted, or approved of those late outrages, and does not publicly condemn them. After wondering, is it the result of accident that the Masons hold all the offices, govern the presses, and control the administration of justice? The Batavia advocate concluded, we must resort to the polls of election. The following February, the Anti-Masonic Party was formed, and soon, they were holding local meetings and state and national conventions, during which resolutions were drafted. The party's main aim was to prevent the election of Masonic candidates, especially Andrew Jackson in 1828 and 1832, and to support anti-Masonic candidates, most notably William Wirt, in his unsuccessful presidential campaign of 1832. Hence, examples of non-Masonic uses of the phrase, before it had become a feature of anti-Masonic rhetoric, do not necessarily detract from my initial observation, as also those that are drawn from a time when anti-Masonry had lost its political usefulness, and many anti-Masons joined the Whig Party in the late 1830s. The most thorough apologetic attempt to discredit the idea that there was a semantic narrowing of the term secret combinations following William Morgan's disappearance in 1826 and during the 1828 campaign is Gregory L. Smith's 2015 interpreter article, Cracking the Book of Mormon's Secret Combinations. While Mr. Smith included an index with 18 additional examples of the non-Masonic use of the phrase secret combinations, between 1833 and 1850, 
His essay focused on 13 examples between 1782 and 1832, evidently believing them to be the most relevant. Among other things, Mr. Smith argued that anti-Masons did not limit the term secret combinations to Masonry, but expanded it to include other secret combinations. But in doing so, he confused hypothetical groups with actual groups. Mr. Smith quotes Solomon Southwick's demand that those seeking political office should swear to and subscribe a declaration, in addition to the oath or oaths now in use, that he was not then a member and would not thereafter become one of any secret self-created combination whatsoever. Apologist Smith argues that this shows that Southwick clearly believes that a wide variety of secret self-created combinations are present and future risks, and that it is implicit evidence that the phrase secret combination was already broadly understood by his audience to apply to any number of nefarious organizations or practices. Naturally, anti-Masons were opposed in principle to anything like Masonry, but this was merely hypothetical and reflected Washington's warning to beware of combinations and associations under whatever plausible character. The hypothetical nature of Southwick's statement is made clear when he subsequently quotes an editorial that refers to Washington's farewell warning and then asks, What secret combination existed in our country at that time except masonry? So, according to anti Masons, Washington specifically referred to Freemasons, but also hypothetically to any similar group that may appear in the future. This is the very definition of semantic narrowing and explains why first readers of the Book of Mormon readily interpreted its discussion of secret combinations with Freemasonry. The resolutions of various anti Masonic conventions adopted Washington's language outright while others paraphrased it. Thus, the Anti-Masonic Convention in Connecticut in 1830 approved a resolution against all secret combinations of men under whatsoever plausible character, while another convention in Philadelphia appointed a committee for the sole purpose of diffusing information extensively on the subject of Freemasonry and other secret combinations against the equal rights of mankind and our free institutions. Political anti-Masons took a stand against all secret societies as incompatible with free institutions, but they also viewed Masonry as polymorphic or diverse in nature, with various independent lodges and orders, such as the York and Scottish Rites. Indeed, they regarded Masonry as an international plot to overturn all free governments, which most notably included the Bavarian German Illuminati, considered by anti-Masons to be a branch of Masonry, that was responsible for the French Revolution. While Mr. Smith quotes anti-Masons referring to other secret combinations, he provides no examples of where anti-Masons actually name these other organizations. The closest he comes is when he quotes one 1830 anti-Masonic source that states that the Jesuits were a secret combination of men and compares them to the Masons. Some anti-Masons speculated that Freemasonry was the invention of English Jesuits. This quote occurs in the 1830 source that Mr. Smith used to make his argument. So, when anti-Masons referred to 17th century Jesuits as a secret combination, they were not using it in a non-Masonic context. Of the 13 examples of the non-Masonic use of secret combinations, between 1782 and 1832, gathered by Mr. Smith, six were before the Morgan Affair. Three of the remaining seven, like the Jesuits previously discussed, are actually Masonic. He therefore overstates his case when he concludes that such evidence demonstrates that Joseph Smith chose the term secret combinations because it was a general term in the United States for any clandestine group or plot especially one in the political realm. On the contrary, Joseph Smith no doubt chose the term because he was well aware that to anti-Masons, Masonry was not just a secret combination. It was the secret combination, seeking to overthrow all free governments, just as the Book of Mormon predicted 
of latter-day secret combinations. In 1838, Methodist minister Leroy Sunderland pointed to the Book of Mormon's terminology as a link to anti-Masonry. This book purports to have been found in 1827, just after the time when there was so much said throughout this nation about Freemasonry. Hence, the reader will find frequent allusions in it to Freemasonry, under the names of secret societies, dreadful oaths, and secret combinations. Interestingly, in a detailed response to Sunderland's criticisms of Mormonism in the Book of Mormon, later the same year, Parley P. Pratt skipped the issue of anti-Masonry entirely. The term secret combinations was in fact defined by anti-Masons themselves. Perhaps the best example comes from the Morgan Investigator, a periodical published near the Smith Farm at Batavia, New York, which declared in its 29th of March 1827 issue, Beware of secret combinations. These are the dying words of General George Washington. Do not these words point with an index that cannot be mistaken to the Society of Freemasons? The same year, Solomon Southwick, editor of the National Observer at Albany, New York, published a solemn warning against Freemasonry, in which he repeated the statement from another newspaper, which bears repeating with further comment. When we hear him, Washington, uttering a farewell warning to his countrymen, to beware of secret combinations, what are we to suppose he means? What secret combination existed in our country at that time except masonry? However, Washington had only warned of combinations and associations, not secret combinations. Anti-Masons had thus added secret to Washington's words to make it appear that he agreed with them. This led Masons to charge Southwick and other anti-Masons with perpetrating a base forgery for political purposes. In 1829, Masons retorted, It is one of the most ridiculous and contemptible forgeries and impositions ever attempted to be palmed upon the public. Nevertheless, tampering with Washington's words to make it appear he had warned against Freemasonry shows that the term secret combination was firmly embedded in their anti-Masonic arsenal. Clearly, when I wrote that the term secret combinations was used almost exclusively to refer to Freemasonry, I meant that the anti-Masonic definition of the term was the dominant one when the Book of Mormon appeared. I think that is what we find in the historical record. Ultimately, whether or not the term secret combinations was used almost exclusively by anti-Masons is less important than it was their favorite term, one that they inaccurately tied to none other than Washington. Joseph Smith had used the right term to help his readers make the right identification without using the name. Peterson rejects the connection I made between the Masons and a number of Joseph Smith's revelations that mention the reason for moving to Ohio and ultimately to Missouri, was to escape secret combinations. Instead, Peterson suggests that the secret combinations were simply persecutors, the mobs with whom Mormons would become so wearily well acquainted. In historical context, it is clear that Smith's revelations describe something more powerful and pervasive than Mormon persecutors, something which functions independently of the Mormons. What is more, contrary to Peterson's assertion, that there is no reason to suppose that the secret combinations alluded to in the Doctrine and Covenants have any connection at all with Freemasonry. There are, in fact, several good reasons for this. On the 9th of February, 1831, shortly after Smith arrived in Ohio, he dictated a revelation announcing that Mormons were to gather to the New Jerusalem in Missouri. Let him that goeth to the east teach them that shall be converted to flee to the west and this in consequence of that which is coming on earth, and of secret combinations. This statement continues a theme of an earlier revelation, dictated in New York prior to leaving, which explained, That which is coming on earth is a desolating war. Behold, the enemy is combined, and now I show unto you a mystery, a thing which is had in secret chambers, to bring to pass even your destruction in process of time and ye knew it not. 
And again, I say unto you, that the enemy in the secret chamber seeketh your lives. Ye hear of wars in far countries, and you say that there will soon be great wars in far countries. But ye know not the hearts of men in your own land. Wherefore, for this cause, I gave unto you the commandment, that ye should go to the Ohio. Believers are warned to flee those who plan their destruction in secret chambers, a term sometimes applied to Masonic lodges. Significantly, there is a close association of secret combinations with the coming war, which makes Peterson's interpretation of Mormon persecutors too narrow. Despite Peterson's apologetic, Joseph Smith nevertheless named the Masons as persecutors. Following his departure to Ohio, Joseph Smith feared that family members remaining in New York were in danger from Morgan-like plots. Evidence of this is provided in a letter Joseph Smith wrote from Kirtland, Ohio to his brother Hiram in Colesville, New York, dated 2nd of December, 1830. Following Hiram's flight from Manchester in October 1830 to evade creditors, his mother reported her bewilderment over his departure since the secret combinations of his enemies were not fully developed. A short while later, a group of men claiming to represent Dr. Alexander McIntyre ransacked the Smith's cabin, looking for Hiram. When Joseph Smith learned of the incident, he wrote to warn Hiram to beware of the Freemasons. McIntyre heard that you were in Manchester, and he got a warrant and went to your father's to distress the family. But Harrison, referring to Brother Samuel Harrison Smith, overheard their talk, and they said that they cared not for the debt if they could obtain your body. They were there with carriages. Therefore, beware of the Freemasons. Masonic records indicate that the Smith family physician, Alexander McIntyre, and Levi Daggett, who sued Hiram and issued a warrant for his arrest, were both members of Palmyra's Masonic Lodge. In his letter to Hiram, Joseph not only revealed an anti-Masonic bias, but expressed his belief that Masons were among the chief persecutors of the Mormons in New York. So, Peterson's attempt to limit secret combinations to persecutions is both inaccurate and incomplete. In context, Joseph Smith's revelations link secret combinations with war breaking out in America, which is what Jackson's opponents feared as well, especially the anti-Masons. Peterson notes that the vast majority of the anti-Masons joined the Rising Whig Party, but at least in Kirtland, the Mormons were Jacksonians almost to a man. In an environment where political deals and compromise were the norm, voting is not the best index of ideological stance. Rather than voting conscience, Mormons tended to vote as a block to maximize their political clout. In Ohio, Mormons unhappily found themselves in counties where the anti-Masons were also anti-Mormons. To repeat what I wrote in 1989, in the political environment of Ohio, where Mormons found themselves in counties dominated by National Republicans, later Whigs, the Mormons quickly learned that the best way to break the economic and political hegemony of the Whigs and establish themselves in the area was to support Jackson and his party. They voted for him even though his party stood for liberalism, separation of church and state, and harbored infidels and masons because their political choices were limited, not because their ideologies were in alignment with the Jacksonians. Translation of the Book of Mormon did not occur in Palmyra, but rather, for the most part, in Harmony, Pennsylvania, Peterson argues. In other words, for almost every dated Palmyra article commonly adduced, Joseph was two or three or perhaps even four days distant in an age that lacked telephone, radio, and television. But the fact remains that frantically anti-Masonic quotations from Palmyra newspapers have no clearly demonstrated direct relevance to the mind of Joseph Smith. On the contrary, Masonry was extensively discussed before Smith's departure from the Palmyra area in December 1827. New York had just completed its state and county elections, which in Smith's region was dominated by Masonic issues. Peterson wonders, without checking, if anti-Masonry was all the rage in harmony as well. So far as I am aware, nobody has attempted to adduce proof. Because harmony was essentially a rural community, 
and unlike Palmyra, had no newspaper, it is difficult to recover the specifics of its political and religious culture. The only newspaper in the county, the Susquehanna Register in Montrose, was considered a Masonic press for its support of Jackson. Nevertheless, it published an account of Morgan's abduction and murder from the New York Spectator in September 1827. A report of the Anti-Masonic Convention in Leroy, New York, in March 1828, extracts from the Oaths of the Royal Arch Degree and Order of the Cross in March 1828, mention of an anti-Masonic meeting in nearby Gibson in October 1828, the resolutions of another anti-Masonic meeting in December 1828, a notice dated 6th of April 1829 and published several times announcing that the anti-Masonic meeting was being rescheduled, and a report that the Anti-Masonic State Convention was held on the 25th of June in Harrisburg, reported in July 1829. A letter published in the Register dated 27th of October 1828 from Montrose and signed a young politician defended Jackson against insinuations that the whole Masonic fraternity in the Union are acting in concert to elevate General Jackson to the presidency on his Masonic merits. The writer points out that some Masons favor Adams' re-election, but complains that some Adams supporters in the eastern part of the county are so much heated with enthusiasm that they insinuate to the people that Jacksonianism and Freemasonry are synonymous. Anti-Masons, meeting in Gibson, Susquehanna County, on the 18th of November, 1828, declared, among other things, that of all secret societies, the Masonic institution, from its numbers, wealth, and corruption of its members, is the most dangerous to civil liberty now in existence. That we consider the institution of Freemasonry as immoral in its tendency, anti-Republican in its principles, and dangerous in the extreme that we concur in the sentiments so commonly expressed by our fellow citizens in the state of New York and elsewhere, that speculative Freemasonry is dangerous to man, wicked in its ceremonies, detrimental to religion and dangerous to the administration of justice. Only the most naive researcher believes that passages from Palmyra newspapers, or even the Susquehanna Register for that matter, represent the mind of Joseph Smith even if it could be demonstrated that Joseph Smith was in the vicinity of Palmyra or Harmony when a specific anti-Masonic editorial was published, it still would not reveal his state of mind, since it could never be demonstrated that he read it. Most researchers have cited local newspapers only to demonstrate that the subject was being discussed in a certain manner. At best, literature, like any artifact, can facilitate only a fragmentary reconstruction of the past. Moreover, newspapers were not the only sources of information, and an author's inspiration is largely untraceable. So, historical and literary criticism can only make indirect connections between a written work and its cultural environment. Fortunately, most researchers appreciate the limitations of their work and proceed cautiously. Some apologists have been too quick to declare victory. Referring to Daniel Peterson's apologetic, the late William J. Hamlin, for example, stated that the supposed Gadiant and Masonry connection has been debunked, and John Gee asserted that the anti-Masonic thesis has been conclusively demonstrated to be a mirage. In this video, I have examined not only Peterson's arguments, but also those of Bushman, Osler, Quinn, and others, and have shown that they have been unsuccessful in overturning the interpretation of the Book of Mormon's first readers, which included Book of Mormon witness Martin Harris. The question is no longer whether Joseph Smith used Masonic and anti-Masonic elements from his environment to create something both similar and unique in the Book of Mormon, but rather to what extent. Nothing the apologists have suggested thus far has rendered unlikely the conclusion that Joseph Smith adopted an anti-Masonic posture in the Book of Mormon. I'm Dan Vogel. Thanks for watching.